As Ryan mentioned to you, this was a very busy week for me. It was the week that I had to give an oral defense for my PhD dissertation. Many of y'all who've been in my life for the past 19, 20 years, you know exactly what I'm talking about. It was an exam that you have to take before you can uh, pass, officially get your doctorate degree, I guess. And I had passed my dissertation already, but I was very nervous about this exam. In fact, I asked David Williamson, who was playing the drums a moment ago, that I need you to drive me to, to the seminary because I'm afraid I'm going to either have a wreck or I'm going to speed, and neither of those things are good right before a big exam. And so, by the way, one of the best things that happened to me was um, that morning, Wednesday morning, as I'm getting ready, I have books open, and I'm going through notes and cramming last minute. Anybody know what it means to cram last minute stuff? And I'm doing all this, and Nicole comes in and says, there's some, somebody here to see you. I said, not right now. I can't see anybody. They're going to have to wait. And he said, no, these people are here to see you. You better come and, and see them. I'm like, oh my goodness. So I walk into the kitchen. The entire staff is there with families and kids. They were there to pray for me. Isn't that awesome? I'm blessed to have a team like that. Now, I could have spent those 20 minutes cramming, but I think those prayers did a whole lot more for me than those 20 minutes of cramming. I can tell you that. Uh, But anyways, after two hours of sitting in the hot seat and answering all the questions, I was told that I passed the exam, and I was very, very relieved, to say the least. Well, thank you. I wasn't expecting a clap there, but I was trying to get that into my message. How does that work? The tie-in is that the Christian life doesn't end, and I'm saved, and when I die, I'm going to heaven. Now, that's great. But there's an exam that you have to take. And the exam is not just on the other side. The exam is taking place right now. It is in this life. Because if you're saved, you're facing an exam where God is the examiner. And He's coming around each of you who claim that you are saved, that you are a Christian, that you are a believer. He's coming around each of you and He's examining The fruits in your life, the fruits which are worthy of repentance. So what we think is, I'm saved, I'm going to heaven, it's all through now. Not true. There's an exam, just like I had to take this exam. Now, I had my 272 pages perfectly done, and I passed, but then there was the exam. And my mentor professor told me that if he had botched that exam, I don't know what I could do then. And I said, oh man, can I really mess that up? Yeah, you can. Same also with us. You say, I prayed the prayer and I have done all those things, but are you producing fruits worthy of repentance? Fruit bearing is the natural outflow of salvation. And by the way, these fruits are not what you might think. You may think fruits means, man, I I don't, hang out at bars anymore, I don't drink, I don't do those bad stuff, I don't cuss like I used to, I'm bearing fruits. Not what you think. The fruits that Jesus is talking about are fruits that are acts of mercy that you demonstrate towards others. And one more thing, as John was emphasizing, your clock is ticking. You don't have much time. You have your Bibles with you, turn to Luke chapter 13, starting in verse 6. We're in our series on the parables of Jesus, and this morning we come to the parable of the barren fig tree. Luke chapter 13, starting in verse 6, let's all stand once again for the reading of God's Word. He, meaning Jesus, also spoke this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it and found none. Then he sent to the keeper of his vineyard, to the gardener, he said, Look, for three years I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Cut it down. Cut it down. Why does it use up the ground? 
It is wasting space. But the gardener answered and said to him, Sir, let it alone this year also until I dig around it and fertilize it. And if it bears fruit, well. But if it not, after that, you can cut it down. Parables are like mirrors. When you read that story, the question is, who are you in that parable? Are you the fig tree that is bearing fruit? Or are you the barren fig tree? Are there fruits worthy of repentance in your life? As I mentioned to you a few moments ago, your clock is ticking. You don't know the time. I mean, you may have 30 years left if Christ doesn't return sooner. You may have three years left. You may have three days. Or could it be that you are living in your last three hours? And the fruit inspector is walking by, and that's not me, that's Jesus Christ. He's examining your life. Are there fruits worthy of repentance in your life? Do you demonstrate acts of mercy towards others? Or is it all about you? And are you saved? Saved really means that you have received God's mercy in your life through Jesus Christ. If you've never done that, would you bow your heads right this moment? It's a simple prayer that says, Jesus, I need you to come into my life. Forgive me of my sins and take over. I believe. I believe that you are God's son who gave his life on the cross for my sins as promised. You died. You were buried. You rose again. And I believe that you are my Savior. Forgive me of my sins and take over. And thank you for saving me. Thank you for changing my eternal destiny. But in this life, help me to live for you, to bear fruits worthy of repentance. And today, God, we pray for every one of these who have just prayed to receive Christ in their lives. Change them. Assure them, God, that now they belong to you, that that tree is now bearing fruits. And the rest of us who do claim to know Christ, open our eyes to our true condition Show us, God, whether or not we are truly bearing fruits. In Jesus' name we pray. Let everyone say together. Amen. Please be seated. Compared to the parables of the wheat and the tares, or the parable of the prodigal son, or even the parable of the good Samaritan we looked at last weekend, today's parable of the barren fig tree is not very popular. Many of you probably heard it for the first time as I read that story. But it's a very important parable. It's a continuation, in a way, of last week's message on the parable of the Good Samaritan. In fact, this parable was given on the same journey that Jesus began in Luke chapter 9 and verse 51. If you remember last weekend's sermon... In Luke 9.51, it tells us that when Jesus knew that the time had come for him to be ascended, that he set his face towards Jerusalem, because this is the place where he was going to die. This was what was promised and prophesied in the Old Testament, that he would die, he would be buried, and he would rise again and then be ascended into the heavens. When Jesus knew the time had come, he started heading towards Jerusalem. And on the way, he said many things. And one thing that he did, if you remember from last weekend's message, is that he sent his disciples into the world. He sent them into the fields. If you remember, the fields are white unto harvest, but the laborers are few. You go out there. I'm sending you out as lambs among wolves. People are going to be mean to you, but don't be mean back to them. Just shake the dust off your feet. Move on. Uh, you preach the gospel. You share the good news. You show mercy to people. And the disciples went and did that, and then they returned with joy. Remember that? And they said, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. Means God, when we went out and we preached the good news, and we met needs instead of judging people, we loved people and helped people, Lives were transformed, and demonic strongholds 
were broken. Do you believe that? That people are under a strong demonic hold in this world? Marriages, families, individuals? Satan is working in a powerful way. But when you go out in the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ, but you go, listen, not to judge people, but to show mercy to them, demonic strongholds are broken. And that's what the disciples came back and said. You won't believe what we're seeing. We're seeing Satan loosening his hold over this world. And what did Jesus do? He praised God and he blessed his disciples and he told them that now you are seeing things and hearing things that David the king and Isaiah the prophet only wished they could see. You are seeing the kingdom of God. You are partaking of eternal life. Folks, eternal life is not just that I receive Jesus as my Savior, and one day when I die, I'm going to heaven. That may be true, but eternal life begins now. The moment you receive Jesus as your Savior, listen, that's the moment eternal life begins. You begin to hear things and see things that God is doing in this world. So all this is happening on that journey towards Jerusalem. And so he tells his disciples, you're going to see greater things coming. And as this is happening, there is a certain lawyer who wants to get in on the action. And this lawyer says, Jesus, how do I get to see things and hear things that others can't? I mean, what do I do? Listen, to inherit eternal life. What I got to do? And what did Jesus say to him? What's in the law? Oh, that's simple. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. What's the second thing? Love your neighbor as yourself. Well, go do it. Go do it. And then he, trying to justify himself, asked the question, which is, who is my neighbor? You know what this man was saying? Oh, I got that covered. The boundaries? Oh, yeah, no problem. I take care of people in my neighborhood. I take care of my neighbors. And Jesus says, you got it wrong. Let me explain to you what a neighbor is. And then he gave the parable of the Good Samaritan. Remember that? Man going from Jerusalem to Jericho, and then he falls among thieves. The priest goes by one way, and the Levite goes by the other way. And who stops? The Samaritan. A sworn enemy of the Jewish people stops and he helps them. And the question is, who is the neighbor out of those three? The priest, the Levite, or the good Samaritan? Who was the neighbor? The Samaritan. The question is not, who is my neighbor? The question should be, who needs a neighbor? Who needs a neighbor? If you remember from last week, a true neighbor is someone who shows, what's the word? Mercy. A true neighbor is someone who shows mercy, and mercy is a distinguishing mark of eternal life. Again, eternal life is not just when I die, I'm going to heaven. Eternal life begins now. You participate in the building of God's kingdom. You see things, you hear things, that even the prophets and the kings only wish they could have. Mercy is the distinguishing mark of eternal life. And if you say you have eternal life, the question comes, what kind of a neighbor are you? Are you a good neighbor? What kind of a neighbor are you? By the way, I'm so encouraged to see and hear the testimonies from so many of you. I even got one this morning. I can't share with you because it's anonymous. And the person requested to stay anonymous because uh, for obvious reasons, don't want to share some information that may come back to that person. But it's awesome for me to hear. How many of y'all know what we're talking about? Last weekend, we gave away $25,000 to you. $25,000. It's a lot of money. Uh, Everybody got a cross, but every family unit... Right? Either your family with five kids, or a family as in husband and wife, or a couple as a unit, or just an individual. You're a single person. 
You still got a cross with a hundred dollar bill. And your job is to what? Is to pray and say, God, who is that person out there who is praying for a miracle, who is praying for you to intervene in their situation? Bring them in my path and I will give this to them. And by the way, the cross has a track around it. Uh, it, it tells about the gospel. So when you're giving this $100 bill, it's not just, hey man, here you go, have a good day. There's a gospel in it. And so you're able to share the gospel. Now you may not have the courage to share the whole gospel, but listen, when you give that cross, they open it up, the gospel is there. The least you can say is, hey, I'm praying for you. Or Jesus loves you. Amen. Can anybody do that? You can do that. At least say, hey, here you go, in Jesus' name. It's amazing. On Facebook, many of y'all share testimonies. Uh, one I saw was uh, really touched my heart. People have been mailing in their testimony cards. If you haven't done that, do it. But if you haven't given it out, that's okay. Be praying and saying, God, who is that person that I need to help? Well, one, one card said, my, the person I gave to was not lying on the side of the street bleeding, but this is a single dad who's trying to do the best he can to raise his family. I thought, Wow. How beautiful is that? And you came along, instead of just beating someone over with your convictions, I got convictions, you got convictions, you came and showed the love of Christ. Awesome. Many of you all are still praying and saying, God, who is that person? And it's awesome to see that because it's important to show mercy. This is important, but put some money behind it. Just like the Samaritan, what did he do? He didn't say, hey, look, I'm going to do the best I can, but i got to go because i got to make a buck. He used his own money. What Jesus was saying to the people was, use your own money. Hey, when we gave you those $100 bills attached to the crosses, you know what we're really doing? We're just priming the pump. We're helping you realize this is what you should be doing on a regular basis. Digging in your own pocket and meeting Need. Now, I'll say this, and I want, to, I want you to hear me very carefully. Unfortunately, not everybody's going to get it. I'm not talking about the $100 bill, but unfortunately, not everybody's going to get it because you have the self-proclaimed critics. They will always find something wrong with it. And if that's you, if that happened to you, just know that the devil infected you. If you just found something wrong with what happened last week and just know that you are standing in a crowd. Let me, let me get to that crowd. How about we get to that crowd? In, in, in Luke chapter 11 and verse 53, here's this crowd that you're standing with. Because when Jesus was saying what he was saying and teaching what he was saying about the mercy with money behind it, not everybody accepted it. Listen to this. And as he said these things to them, this is all in that same journey as he's headed to Jerusalem. As he said these things to them, the scribes and the Pharisees began to, what's the word? Assail him. How can you assail somebody for challenging you to show mercy to someone in need? I don't get it, but it happens. I'm, sitting, I'm telling you right now, this moment, there are people sitting in here. The devil got to you. Satan got to you. You're like, well, you know, the money. You know, I've been thinking about it. I'm like, oh, shush. <laughs> it wasn't yours to begin with. It's a gift to you. Give it away. Don't get in the way. And listen to what happens here. Just the same way as Jesus is talking about the Good Samaritan, and maybe the young lawyer got it, but these people, go back to verse 53. They began to assail him vehemently and to, what's the word? Cross-examine. They began to examine him about many things, verse 54, lying in wait for him and seeking to catch him in something he might say that they might accuse him. Guess where are the worst critics you'll find? In the church. Not outsiders. Guess what the outsiders would say? Wow, that's amazing. I've never heard a church like that. Church people are like, well, you know, I think about this, you know. What's wrong with you? Guess what? When you become like that, when you are that kind of a critic, you're not standing in the line with the disciples and Jesus. You're with the scribes and the Pharisees. Good luck. You know where they went. 
I hope someone is getting, uh, getting this message. In other words, they missed his message of mercy completely, and they were trying to cross-examine Jesus. But listen to what Jesus does. This is powerful. Luke chapter 12, verse 40, he says, um, Be ready, boys. Be ready. For the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Now keep in mind, they are trying to examine him, and he says, "Uh Uh-oh, I think you got that backwards. I am the examiner. It's like if I were to go into my Ph.D. oral defense and as we sit down and they're like, you want a cup of coffee or anything? Everybody good? And I'd be like, oh, yes, it's great. Okay, sounds good. And then instead of them asking me a question, what if I had started with something like, so, okay, the first question I have for you, Dr. Robinson, is what do you think they would say to me? (laughs) We ask you questions, not the other way around. Dr. Corolzo, the, the question I have for you is that why in the world, you know, he would say, get out of here. When you begin to question Christ and what he has said, hey, listen, he is the examiner, not you. And that's what they were doing to him. So Jesus says, be ready, boys, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect, verse 42. And the Lord said, who then is that faithful and wise steward whom his master will make ruler over his household to give them their portion of food in due season, which means this. I'm coming to check and see, are you being a good steward? You know what most churches think about stewardship? Get the money, lock it up in a bank account, and sit on it for a rainy day. Put it in the cemetery fund. I'm not lying. I mean, listen, I know about the churches. Put it in that little fund where the preacher can't touch it, where we wouldn't do anything for anybody, sit on it. You know what stewardship really is? God has blessed you, now go bless other people. I'm not telling you not to plan out your life or save money or use it wisely, none of that. But you should be the one being a blessing to others. Listen to what Jesus says. In verse 43, blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. And by the way, this is not necessarily the second coming. You know what we think often is that Jesus is gone and he is coming again, right? I may or may not be here. If I'm here, I hope. He will overlook me. But if I'm not here, guess where I'm at? I'm in heaven, so guess what? I skipped the test. Do you really think that's what Jesus intended? No. The test had already begun. For you this morning, the test is on. It is not something that's going to happen on the other side when you get before God. There's a test coming there. But in this life, Jesus, if you claim Him, is walking by, checking to see each of you, are you bearing fruits worthy of repentance? It's in this life. Well, let's keep moving. Blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes, verse 44, truly I say to you that he will make him ruler over all that he has. So if you're being faithful now, uh, Jesus says, I'll give you more. But if that servant says in his heart, my master is delaying his coming. means I don't see Jesus. No one is checking my fruits. If the servant says, my master is delaying his coming and begins to beat the male and female servants and to eat and drink and be drunk. What does that mean? You're using your wealth for your own benefit. You don't care about anybody else. Folks, you may not physically go beat somebody, but when you know someone's in need and you don't do anything and you walk right past them, it's just as bad as beating that person up. So listen to what Jesus says in verse 46. The master of that servant will come on a day when he is not looking for him and at an hour when he is not aware and will what do what? Can you all see on the screen? What will he do to you? 
and will cut him in two and appoint him his portion with the... This is in the Bible. Did you know that? This is in the Bible. Oh, I prayed the prayer. Pastor Shah, don't you remember you baptized me? Friends, do you think that's it? Do you really think that praying a prayer and getting baptized is all there is to Christian life? That I'm going to live for myself now until I need Jesus again. No. The examiner is walking by your life right this minute and he's checking to see how are you using the gifts, the materials that she has given you. And if you don't use it wisely, he will cut you up in two and throw you with the unbelievers. It's in the book. Oh, uh, that was meant for the people at the time because the dispensation. Hey, listen, be very careful about that because if you start chalking everything for someone else, then what part of the Bible do you want to actually obey? Because everything is for someone else, right? The Old Testament was for the people of Israel or the people of Judah. Uh, The New Testament is for the first century Jewish people. I mean, who is what is left for us? The concordance, the dictionary in the map, the maps. What do you think is left? No, folks, this applies to you. This applies to me. When I don't do something to show mercy based on what God has blessed me. Cut into, appoint him as portion with the unbeliever, but it's not over. Listen to verse 47. And that servant who knew his master's will and did not prepare himself or do according to his will shall be what? Beaten with many stripes. Verse 48. But he who did not know, yet committed things deserving of stripes shall be beaten with few. Which means this, you're here this morning and say, you know, Pastor Shah, we didn't know about how important mercy is. Well, you might get a little bit of a whooping. And I don't know what that looks like. But you're getting something. God understands. But now, you cannot say you don't know that mercy is a distinguishing mark of eternal life. But keep reading verse 48. It says, for everyone to whom much is given, from him much will be required. And to whom much has been committed of him, they will ask the more. In verse 56, this is powerful, hypocrites. You discern the face of the sky. I mean, you have phones right now. You can tell, is it going to be cold this week? It's going to be 20 degrees, right? How many of you already checked the weather? 20 degrees? It's going to be a cold week coming up. Jesus tells the Pharisees, the scribes, You are hypocrites. You can discern the face of the sky and of the earth, but how is it that you do not discern this time? You can tell how the weather is going to change, but you cannot tell that right this moment, listen, right this moment, Jesus is walking by your life and He's examining your fruits. And what are the fruits? We'll come to that. Human beings are masters of deflection. Now, you know what that means? Deflection is called changing the subject. Anybody know, has ever changed the subject? When something gets too uncomfortable, what do we say? Hey, somebody change the subject. Anybody done that here? At family gatherings, there's always that ant. You're pointing fingers at each other. It's like that ant, when she opens her mouth, it's over. Change the subject, be ready. Guess what these people did? No different. Isn't that amazing that 2,000 years ago, the human psyche was the same? They realized what Jesus was talking about and judgment. Who wants to talk about judgment? Who wants to talk about bearing fruits? And so they decided to change the subject. Listen to Luke chapter 13, verse 1. There were present at that season some who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. Now, we don't have any historical record of this incident. But based on what we know about Pilate, he would do things like this. In fact, many times he was called back to Rome to give an account for some of the the atrocities that he, he, he did. But here's my question. Jesus is talking about showing mercy. He's talking about helping those in need. And their statement is, oh, Jesus, did you hear the other day some people got killed and Pilate killed them in the temple? 
What are you talking about? What's the point? The point was they were changing the subject. Now, Jesus, you know, being God, of course, he knew their hearts. So what does Jesus do? I love this. I love it. Looks like, you know, a good teacher. He says to them, Do you suppose that these Galileans were worse sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered such things? I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. means get back on subject. What are we talking about? We're talking about repentance and bearing fruits worthy of repentance. Stay on subject. And, and just in case you want to you deflect again and change the subject again, listen to verse 4. Or those 18, because I'm sure there was someone about to say, Oh, by the way, did you hear about those 18 on whom the tower fell? It's called small talk. And guess what Jesus says? Or those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them, do you think that they were worse sinners than all other men who dwelt in Jerusalem? I'll tell you no, but guess what? Unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. means stop trying to distract me. It's not working. Hey, here's a question to you. Do you do that? Do you like to deflect when the Holy Spirit begins to put His finger in your chest and you feel that pressure? You know, I'm preaching to you and you can feel the Holy Spirit saying, you know, you're the one. You're the one. And you like to deflect. You look here, you look there, you pull out your phone. Or, or you know, on the way out, you make light of the sermon or you find something else to joke about, guess what you're doing? You're doing the same thing they did. And guess what Jesus said? Ah, don't, stay on, on target. Stay with the topic. Unless you repent and start doing this, same thing is going to happen to you, says Jesus. And at this point, I'm giving you the context, at this point he gives the parable of the fig tree. Listen again to that parable in closing. He says, A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard. He came seeking fruit on it and found none. And he said to the keeper of his vineyard, Look, three years I've been coming, and there's no fruit. Cut it down. Why does it use up the ground? By the way, fig tree was a symbol of national Israel. But keep in mind, this is not just meant for Israel. It's also meant for all of us. The fruit inspector is coming by. Three years he has come by, but he has found no fruit. Cut it down. It's wasting space. Now, here's where people make a big mistake. They think that fruits worthy of repentance or fruits in your life are, you know, the bad things you used to do, you don't do them anymore. So you don't break the Ten Commandments anymore. Uh, you keep the Sabbath day on Sunday, man, I don't work. You know, I, I believe that that's a sacred day. I don't cuss like I used to. I don't go to bars. Like the old adage, I don't drink, I don't chew, and I don't go with girls who... Y'all never heard that? And I'm not even from here. <laughs> How does that work? You know, I, I, I'm just a good guy. I, I don't do anything too bad. Is that what Jesus had in mind? He talks about bearing fruits. Well, to get his true meaning, you have to back up to Luke chapter 3. Back up to Luke chapter 3 because someone else used the exact same analogy. Guess who that was? He was the cousin of Jesus. Who was he? John the Baptist. Listen to this. Luke chapter 3 and verse 7. Then he said to the multitudes, it's not Jesus, this is John the Baptist. He said to the multitudes that came out to be baptized by him, he said, brood of vipers. Talk about a friendly church. You walk in the church, you're a bunch of snakes. Brood of vipers, who warns you to flee from the wrath to come? Now, can you read this one with me? Verse 8, ready? On the screen, wake up. All right, let's read it. Therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance. And do not begin to say to yourselves, 
We have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. Keep reading verse 9. And even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into... That's the exact same imagery Jesus used in this parable. So what are the fruits? Ah, we have... The answer to that, because they asked John the Baptist. Listen to this in verse 10. So the people asked him, saying, what shall we do then? He answered and said to them, he who has two tunics. You know what a tunic is? It's like a robe, like a coat. He who has two tunics, let him give to him who has none. And he who has food... Let him do likewise. You know what the fruits worthy of repentance are? Showing mercy. You got two coats. Somebody over there has none. Go give it to them. You know, uh, through our church, last month we gave away 140 winter clothes to kids in this neighborhood. Just not very far from here. We did it. Many of you all provided for that. Do you know that in about two months or a month now, we're going to give 200 pairs of shoes to children in the underprivileged community. Many of y'all are doing that. I wish it was 500. You know, you say, oh, they'll get a check. You know, that's all. You have no idea. Many of us go into the school system, we eat lunch, and you see kids with holes in their shoes. They have nothing. And you say, oh, my kids do too. I've seen my kids have holes in their shoes, but they, they have the assurance that when dad is not as busy, he'll go get you one. Usually it's not me, it's Nicole. They're going to get their shoes. If it's up to me, they would be walking in slippers all their life. But, but they know, it's, but for them, nothing is coming. You all getting this? The fruits worthy of repentance is not, is not, I don't chew and I don't drink and I don't cuss and I'm a good father and provider. The fruit is, you got two coats, give one away. You have food, give it to those who don't. But it's not over. Then tax collectors also came to be baptized, and they asked him, teacher, what shall we do? And listen to what he says. Collect no more than what is appointed for you. Which means this. When it comes to mercy, it involves dollar bills. Yeah, you can collect more from them, but give them a break. Help them out. You know what we did this past weekend? Those crosses are helping you, are helping you understand the value of bearing fruits worthy of repentance. You know why we did it? Because we care about you. We don't want you to miss out while sitting in church all your life and get on the other side and God says, depart from me, I never knew you. Wait a minute, Pastor Shaw, don't you remember? My job right now is to help you examine your life. So when the examiner is coming by, there will be fruits. You're getting this? Who's getting this? It's not over. Listen to this. Likewise, the soldiers asked him, saying, what shall we do? So he said to them, do not intimidate anyone or accuse falsely, which means this, don't take bribes. People don't have any money anyways. Don't, don't, don't do that to them. Be content with your wages. Be content with your wages. You see, fruits worthy of repentance are acts of mercy. Hey, this, this week, this month, this year, how merciful have you been? How merciful have you been? Who have you helped? When was the last time you paid for someone's gas? When was the last time you bought food for some family? When was the last time you saw someone sitting outside the hospital and you, you, you just looked at them and they're sitting there, you walk right past them. You know what they're asking? How am I going to pay for my medication? When was the last time you did that? The examiner is looking for that fruit. Go back to the parable in closing. 
So, verse 7, Then the owner of the vineyard said to the keeper of his vineyard, Look, for three years I have been coming, seeking fruit on this fig tree, and I find none. Cut it down. Why does it use up the ground? But he answered and said to them, Sir, let it alone this year also until I dig around it and fertilize it. You know what I'm doing here preaching? I'm, I'm, I'm just aerating the soil. I'm digging around it. You know what Ryan is doing? When you send your youth, he is digging around, aerating the soil, so air and water can get in there, and he's putting some fertilizer. You know what your Sunday school teachers are doing? You know what Alice Pinnell is doing in the women's class? She is digging around you, aerating the soil so water and air can get in, so you can bear fruit. So once in a while, that shovel hits too close, and you get a little bruise on the stem. Don't get angry with me. Are y'all getting this? I can't believe you talk like that. Mm. Right now, I'm a little tip with him. Right. Lady, I'm trying to help you out. I'm just trying to aerate that soil. Are y'all getting this? So sometimes it may get a little harsh. Don't, don't get all worked up. Just examine your fruits. Start bearing fruits, okay? The inspector is looking for you. I'm just helping you out. I'm trying to buy time for you. And not just me, folks. Listen, you might be buying time for someone else because you have people in your life who are not living for the Lord. You have people. You have uncles and aunts and friends and family who are not bearing fruits. And sometimes they get upset with you when you invite them to church, right? It's like, ugh. They're just digging around, helping you out. But verse 9, if it bears fruit, well. But if not, after that you can cut it down. Your clock is ticking. This is in the Bible. I didn't come up with this. Your clock is ticking. 